Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, today we shall try to tackle a yet another important aspect of immune disorders simply called autoimmunity. Now as the name itself suggests autoimmunity can be broken down into two important aspects the immune part of it and the auto part of it but is it that simplistic at all? We know that as you age, you get a host of autoantibodies in the patient's serum, which react to different tissues of the body as wear and tear continues. So should all patients be then labeled as autoimmune disorder patients? The answer is no. There are few prerequisites that one has to know to label a person having an autoimmune disorder. Now why do you have to learn about this disease? It is estimated that around 1 to 2 percent of the United States population has a prevalence of autoimmune disorders. Now if you extrapolate that data to an Indian subcontinent, the population prevalence becomes quite large. And it is entirely possible that in your future practice, you will see a host of disorders under this, maybe much more than you see malignancies in your daily practice, hence the need to know. Now there are certain prerequisites before you call autoimmune disorders. Most important one is the presence of an autoimmune reaction which is specific to a particular tissue or self antigens. Now this is very important because you have to serologically or histologically demonstrate that these autoantibodies are specifically targeting certain antigens. The second criteria is to demonstrate that this immune reaction is entirely primary in the sense that it is not secondary to tissue damage. As alluded to earlier, you can get tissue damage as you go along, as you wear and tear of the tissues continue and then an autoantibody response is mounted against that. That my friends is not autoimmunity. You should demonstrate it as a primary pathology. The third important cog in the wheel is to rule out the absence of other well-defined causes of the disease. There are a host of other conditions which can cause secondary autoimmunity. Those are not autoimmune disorders. You need to have a more detailed idea about that. So having met all of these three prerequisites, you may have entered the territory of autoimmune disorders. Now certain disorders of autoimmune spectrum are organ specific such as a thyroid. Some of you may have encountered patients with Hashimoto's thyroiditis or Graves disease. Type 1 diabetes mellitus, India is the diabetes capital of the world. You will still see patients with type 1 diabetes mellitus. Mind you that also is an autoimmune disorder. You may think of multiple sclerosis or even closer home you have a lot of patients of lupus or systemic lupus erythematosus which we will tackle in the ensuing classes. These are all relevant autoimmune disorders. As you can see in those examples, some of them are organ specific, some of them are generalized or multi-system such as an SLE. Now all of this, how do they come about? Let us try to understand them a little bit in detail. How do they manifest in a person's body? This has entirely to do with a breakdown of something that we all need to have called tolerance. But in the context of immunity, we are talking about tolerance or self-tolerance. Now an important aspect of this is the physiology part of it. Having trying to know what the physiology is, it slightly becomes easier. Having a good understanding of the physiology will give us a better idea about what happens in the pathological aspects. So what is immunological tolerance or self-tolerance as it is also called? It is basically an unresponsiveness to an antigen due to the exposure of body's lymphocytes priorly to those antigens which means that your lymphocytes are now trained 
not to recognize these antigens of your own bodies as foreign. It recognizes them as self and don't react against them. This is called tolerance. Now tolerance occurs in two important aspects as we said. You have what is called as, it happens in the central organs such as the thymus and in the bone marrow where it is called as central tolerance and outside of that it occurs in other tissues where simply put it is called as peripheral tolerance. So central meaning developing the central lymphoid organs and peripheral in the periphery. Now as detailed earlier, the central lymphoid organs occurs in the thymus and in the bone marrow. Now what happens in the level of the thymus? Now as the naive T cells in the cortex of the thymus are being constantly exposed to the antigen presenting cells from the periphery, you expect a certain response as we have seen in the initial two classes. You expect these naive cells to become activated, release cytokines and then bring to a halt whatever antigen has incited the result in the first place. Now this does not happen. During the course of development, these lymphocytes in your thymus are trained to become inert or neutral. Now how does that become? Number one is an important aspect is called as deletion. Now deletion is an important mechanism where once these lymphocytes encounter the antigen, they are neutered or rendered inactive by means of apoptosis or programmed cell death. So no longer will be the cell able to function or thrive. So this is an important mechanism to reduce this population of cells which may be potentially self-reactive. That's how your cells are getting trained. Now there is an important other important aspect of this is what is called as regulatory T cells. Now these are small subset of your T cells which are devoted to the pathway of lymphocyte inactivation or stimulation. A detailed role of that we will come to in a couple of slides but the time being remember this also happens at the level of thymus. Now while at the level of the bone marrow you will see the B cells of course being maturing, differentiating and releasing into the bloodstream. There also there is an important aspect of deletion where all these self reactive B lymphocytes are rendered inactive. Another mechanism is what is called as receptor editing which means that all these receptors on the surface of the B lymphocytes have different configurations because of gene rearrangements. A small structural change in those receptors means that they will be not reacting against a particular antigen. So constantly you have a dynamic change occurring within your B lymphocytes where all these antigens on the surface are changing as time goes. So you have very heterogeneous population to react to, so hence you will get a diversity. Hence these B lymphocytes will not react to the body zone antigens because your configuration keeps changing. This is called as receptor editing. Now these are two important mechanisms in T and B effectively within what is called as central tolerance. Now this is important to know that mutations in any of these mechanisms can result in autoimmune disorders. AIRE what is called as autoimmune regulator is an important mechanism where these regulatory T cells come into play. Now any mutation in this AIRE exposes the patient as literature alludes to can result in lot of autoimmune conditions. Now this is about central tolerance. Now what is peripheral tolerance? Now peripheral tolerance occurs at the level of tissues where some of the cells in the central tolerance would have entirely escaped. Now what should happen to them? You always have a check and balance which happens at the peripheral tissues also. An important mechanism is what is called as energy. It is not energy but energy with the A. Now what is energy? Once the antigen encounters the lymphocyte, that lymphocyte is rendered functionally inactive. This is an important mechanism in the context of T cells which we have studied earlier. Now we know that T cells as you can see up on your screen requires two important events to get stimulated. Number one, you require the antigen presenting cells which have to hone in here as you can see on the top of the screen, the antigen presenting cells will bring in the antigen in combination with MHC class 2 molecule because it is a, a CD4 lymphocyte, let us take the context of that and signal 1 is generated because of the structural rearrangement of the T cell receptor. But on the right end of the screen you can see you require another molecule 
which is called as key cell associated molecules such as CD28, which binds specifically to co-stimulators such as B7 or B7 is also called as CD80 or 86 sometimes. Once it binds to this co-stimulators, only then signal 2 is generated resulting in activation of your T cells. Now without signal 2, a signal 1 cell is not functionally active. Bear in mind this aspect because now you can see that without these molecules, you can have what is called as energy. Now here you have on your screen, once the antigen presenting cells reacts to your T lymphocytes, there is a down regulation in the molecules such as CD28. So your associated molecule level drops, so you do not have a signal 2. Now also it has been noted in certain conditions where a lot of cross-sectional studies available, there is upregulation of other molecules such as CTLA4. In a developing organ, CTLA4 molecules are specifically more. So they have a higher affinity to bind the co-stimulatory molecules. So CTLA4, B7 and not CD28. Now you can imagine a condition where you have signal 1 being generated and no signal 2. So what happens to T cells? They are rendered inactive or they cannot produce cytokines. Hence this is another important checking mechanism wherein a cell can be neutralized. This is called as energy. Yet another important mechanism in the same vein is what is called as apoptosis as we have seen earlier or programmed cell death as we better know it. Now those cells which have escaped the concept of energy now will be rendered towards apoptosis. It has been seen that there is an upregulation in the molecules which are pro-apoptotic which signal cell death such as high level of BIM and there are anti-apoptotic molecules which are downregulated, such as BCL2 and BCLX. Now this is a context where you have an overdrive of pro-apoptotic pathways being generated. Also it has been seen that there is upregulation in level of FAS-FAS ligand which we remember from our classes on apoptosis induces the death domain pathway of apoptosis. So all these T lymphocytes which have escaped energy may, may be checked at the second point by means of apoptosis. So the pool of self-reactive T lymphocytes are brought down. Yet another mechanism which is less understood but relevant nonetheless is the role of regulatory T cells. T cells, of course they are derived from the thymus as we have seen earlier. As you can see on your screen, they are a subset of population which are available within the thymus itself. They express a high level of molecules such as CD25, interleukin 2 and FOXP3 which are required for CD4 cell maintenance and differentiation during the growth phase of a human being. Now they also are a storehouse of a multiple factors such as interleukin 10 and transforming growth factor beta which have a profound role in inactivating the lymphocyte activity. So your lymphocyte stimulation is brought down. So regulatory T cells also help to reduce the self reactive pool of T lymphocytes. So now you have the concept of central and peripheral tolerance. At the level of peripheral tolerance you have AAR which is energy, apoptosis and regulators. Okay, so these are the physiological mechanisms, the checks and balances which keep us sane and not having autoimmune disorders. Now the mechanisms of autoimmunity to understand this concept we, it is very important to know the pathological aspect of it. So what happens to counter all these defense mechanisms available in your body? Now this is always a problem the, as the balance of the scales tips towards one, you have a disorder. As you can see on the screen, you have lymphocyte activation and tolerance and when the balance tips towards lymphocyte activation, your tolerance reduces, all this vanishes away and all you are left with is something to counter it which is the pathological aspect of it which is autoimmune disorders. Now mechanisms of autoimmunity to understand it, you have to understand it is always a multi-pronged event. Nothing happens in isolation but it is when these all factors cluster together you have a disorder at hand. Now you have what is called as inheritance of what is called as susceptibility genes. You might have seen from your own practice or reading it or anecdotally even that certain individuals are more prone to develop a disorder than the others. Now how does that happen? Because all of us are endowed with the same properties, same molecular genetics, 
with mild variations, of course. But how is that one population is affected more than the others? It's simply because there's always a susceptibility due to some change in the genes, resulting in these people becoming more prone to develop autoimmune disorders. Now, what do these susceptibility genes do? Effectively, they contribute to the breakdown of this aspect, that is, your immunological tolerance. It breaks down this mechanism at different stages, resulting in lymphocyte activation. The other important trigger that is required is an environmental aspect. Now, environmental triggers, let it be infections, different allergens, or very other miscellaneous conditions, can promote the activation of self-reactive T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes, as we'll see in the ensuing examples. Now, you have susceptibility genes, and then you have environmental factors. Now, susceptibility genes, it is important to study that susceptibility genes, you have what are called as HLA or MHC alleles, and you have non-HLA. Now, HLA is a very important vital integral aspect, and we know HLA because certain disorders have a high proponent of HLA allelism, such as B27, where ankylosing spondylitis is invariable in those individuals. Or let us take the class two molecules, such as DRB1 or 2, where rheumatoid arthritis can ensue. You have also a host of other molecules, such as non-HLA genes, where you still have autoimmunity. What has brought to sharp focus is in the case of diabetes mellitus type 1 and rheumatoid arthritis, there's a molecule called as PTPN22, which is a phosphatase, which is an inhibitor usually of tyrosine kinase. Now, once there is a mutation in this, you require the check balance over the tyrosine kinase is lost, resulting in overdrive or activation of T lymphocytes. It's even postulated that PTPN22 may be the most prevalent deleted allelism in human beings. You have other molecules such as NOD2, which is required to keep a check of the gut microbial organisms, and a counterbalance of that is Crohn's disease, which is an important inflammatory bowel disease. You have receptors such as interleukin-2 and interleukin-7, which result in multiple sclerosis. So, inheritance of these susceptibility genes can predispose an individual to autoimmune disorders. What is the role of the environment, though? Now, environment, what it does is upregulates the expression It results in upregulation of co-stimulatory molecules. Now, we had learned at the level of the concept of deletion and also receptor editing that you have these regulatory molecules or co-stimulatory molecules also, such as B7, or it's called a CD80 or 86, which were required to generate signal 2. Now, because there's a preferential upregulation of these levels, they bind with CD28 more preferentially, resulting in the activation of the T cells, which produces a host of cytokines, so on and so forth. Usually, the trigger, as you can see on your screen, is a microbial organism, which activates your T cells, and there is upregulation of these B7 molecules, resulting in activation of CD28, and then it continues in the domain of immune tolerance being broken down. The role of infection also has an important mechanism, which is called as molecular mimicry. It simply mimics. So, as your antibodies are mounting a response against an invading microbial organism, the same will cross-react against your own antigens. Why do you ask? The reason being, there is some sequential change in amino acid sequences between the microbes as well as the antigens. And this subtle difference, of course, makes the cell confused. It doesn't know what to react to. So, it will react both against the microbes as well as the body's own tissue. So, it mimics at the level of the molecular level resulting in damage to the tissue. So, this is also is an important aspect. And a typical example of this is type 1 diabetes mellitus, where in case of a response mounted against a virus, you have a bystander effect over the islet cells, and the beta cells, of course, will be destroyed. But the third important mechanism in this chain is what is called as epitope spreading. As the infection continues in the human body, these microbes can alter your self-antigens, and then it exposes certain sites on those antigens, which were hidden from your immune system. So far, they were sequestered. Now, because of a microbial insult, they become released. But your body doesn't have a memory of the same. So, what will the body do? It will react directly against these antigens. This epitope spreading results in a robust reaction of the T cells and B cells against the 
hidden antigens resulting in autoimmune disorders. Then important mechanism also is what is called as polyclonal B cell activation. The B cell activation in the context of viral disorders such as HIV which is very topical of course and Epstein-Barr virus may produce a host of autoantibodies and these autoantibodies will react against the body's own tissues, a lesser known mechanism but relevant nonetheless. So to summarize at the level of pathogenesis, you have an inheritance of susceptibility genes which renders a person more susceptible to develop an autoimmune disorders which is also insulted by environmental triggers which include upregulation of co-stimulators which breaks down your tolerance, molecular mimicry while attacking the microbes also attacks your body's own system, epitope spreading which gives it versatility and whatever was hidden gets exposed and then your body reacts to it at a later stage and of course polyclonal B cell activation. So these are important pathological processes where autoimmunity can continue. So this was about the physiological aspect and the pathology of autoimmune disorders. In the ensuing class we shall try to tackle a very important autoimmune disorder which is systemic lupus erythematosus. Thank you.